Hi, everyone. Well, thanks for joining our webinar on uh, launching a business in New Zealand, specifically an Australian business in New Zealand. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll jump straight into it. Before we do that, though, I'll do a bit of a quick intro. Um, I'm uh, Lachlan McKnight, CEO of Legal Vision, and we have Georgina Toomey uh, with us um, online, um, who um, is uh, the head of our sort of New Zealand operation, uh, New Zealand corporate lawyer. Um, and is going to be taking us through, um, you know, everything that we need to know uh, about launching an Australian business in, in New Zealand. So hi, hi, hi Georgina. Hi, Lachlan. Good to have you. So before we get started, just a quick note, we have a special offer for everyone who's uh, attending the webinar. I'll announce that at the end of the webinar. So, um, you know, just uh, stay online to, to make sure you find out about that special offer. Um, so, so look, um, we sort of thought of doing this webinar for two reasons. One, obviously, there are a lot of Australian businesses that do look to launch um, in New Zealand as a, I guess, a first sort of international foray, international expansion. The second reason is that Legal Vision actually launched in New Zealand in, in January. So we have, uh, I guess, first-hand knowledge in, in doing this. And so we thought we'd bring those two sort of things together into a webinar to give everyone, a, you know, who's, who's listening in a bit of insight into, um, you know how we how we go about that uh, before we um, get into the details George, georgina do you want to give us a bit of background on 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 your experience as a new zealand lawyer and, and what you've done over the years yeah of course so um i if i started with legal vision at the start of this year with our launch into the new zealand market uh, which has been pretty exciting six months uh, of launch uh before that i have been in sort of various uh medium to large firms in New Zealand and the corporate teams uh, specialising in M&A law uh, and also capital raising work so along with your, your general corporate commercial work so um, yeah the opportunity to kind of get legal vision off the ground in, in Australia has been um, quite a, a cool sort of challenge um, and yeah it's been it's been um, a pretty exciting six months so um, it's just a good application of those skills I guess uh, in, in a different market. Uh, and obviously the, the opportunity to then work with our Australian clients to, to go and launch in New Zealand is sort of an obvious um, space that we want to really focus on and, and help our clients with. Great. So um, other thing worth mentioning is uh, Georgina um, came to Sydney for a, for a week uh, this week um, and is uh, now being locked out of uh, New Zealand. So she's stuck in Sydney until until this latest sort of outbreak is under control. So we'll, um, yeah. Look, what it is, that's right. And so I guess this is, an, it's been an interesting um, year and a half for, for this sort of thing in terms of running a business in New Zealand. It's, uh, you know, the whole COVID situation has obviously made things um, more, more difficult. And for anyone who's um, obviously uh, launched over there, I'm sure you're kind of seeing the same thing. And it is something to consider for anyone planning on launching. All right, let's let's sort of get into the um, the, the the nuts and, uh, and bolts of, of, of how to set up in New Zealand. Now, of course, for a lot of businesses, it's not going to make sense to expand overseas. Um, but it, it's fair to say that if you are thinking about overseas expansion, New Zealand is probably the easiest place to expand to. Um, and I guess the reason for that is, you know, first of the kind of structure. Um, the, the structure you can use over there, the, the similarity in, 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 in the both the legal jurisdiction kind of side of things, but also the similarity in the way business is done. Um, and it's those things. And then obviously the fact that it's only three hours away and, 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 and from a time zone perspective, you can kind of run uh, run a lot of your operations from Australia. Um, you don't have to you know, set up everything in New Zealand like you would have to do if you launched in, say, the UK or the US or somewhere else. Um, so. Let, let's get into structuring your New Zealand, New Zealand operations. Assuming that a business has decided to, to kind of go ahead and, and launch over there, what are the, the options as to how they can kind of run a, a New Zealand business, George? Yeah, so there's, it's, it's an interesting one. There's a few kind of options there, kind of depending on, I guess, what stage you're at. Um, the first one would be just to basically have no physical presence in New Zealand, um, just run kind of an online um, business only. And the reason to do that, um, or the benefit of doing that, would be that you're not subject to New Zealand tax, and so you can just sort of, um, I guess, completely forget about kind of the complications that arise there. Because I know a lot of new businesses are, are concerned about the implications of tax when you when you open up in New Zealand. Um, 
for most businesses wanting to launch in New Zealand, if they've got to that stage, it's probably not really a viable option, um, but it can appeal if you want to just test the market and see whether it's going to work or not. Um, but you do need to be very careful to yeah. monitor it to make sure that you know, you're not tipping into the category where you should actually have a permanent kind of business here. So if you did want to kind of um, get sort of more of a permanent business in New Zealand, then you're looking at either operating through you know, a New Zealand branch. So basically all you need to do is register as a foreign entity on the company's office, which is our ASIC equivalent. Um, it sort of seems like the most straightforward option and it's certainly very attractive uh, to businesses wanting to do it, but there are, you know, there's some risks in taking that approach. Um, you know, there's fewer tax deductions that are available using that structure. Um, you could be subject to, to double taxing, which is um, obviously something that you really need to be focusing on. Um, other things that you need to think about are, you know, depending on the size of your Australian business, you might need to be filing your financial statements. Um, they will be publicly available, so you need to be sort of comfortable that your competitors could, you know, could see those that financial information for your Australian business. And what is the size threshold for, for filing so in, in New Zealand? Total assets of um, 20 mil or revenue over 10 mil. Um, so it's still, it's still pretty large, but it's something to sort of think about, you know, if you're growing and scaling how you want to in Australia, that could be quite a real kind of implication in New Zealand. Um, and then I guess from a corporate structuring perspective, you're, you know, you're not operating your New Zealand business through a separate legal entity. So your Australian company will be exposed to, to the trade risk of your New Zealand operations. Um, yep. So when we kind of see clients mostly sort of tending towards and what we certainly recommend as well as looking to set up a separate New Zealand company um, and that might be either a wholly owned subsidiary um, or you might just have it directly owned by, um, by your Australian shareholders. So, you know, I guess the benefits of doing that is really easy to incorporate a company in New Zealand um, and often we find uh, businesses will do that themselves. So that comes with its own risks, which we can cover later. Um, you've obviously got that separate legal entity, so you're ring fencing your trade risk away from your Australian business. Um, you do have the same potential tax issues in terms of um, the potential for double taxing, but you can definitely structure it in a way, we've got more flexibility with the structure to you know, either eliminate those risks or at least minimise them to the extent you can. Um, Okay. So, and, and I think you know, to, you know, in terms of our personal experience of setting up over in New Zealand, it was very easy to incorporate a company over there. Um, very, very easy. And look, it's easy in Australia as well, to be fair. So, um, but I think what, one one thing that's interesting with the sort of New Zealand, I guess, jurisdictional structure is that because it's quite a small country, uh, there's not different states, um, and there's, there's just kind of one. I guess New Zealand-wide um, set of regulations, way of doing things, and so on and so forth. And that's something that, you know, for us setting up over there, we, we've made things a lot easier. Whereas in Australia, you know, sometimes you have to kind of deal with different states in terms of things like payroll tax. Um, certainly, if you're setting up a, a, a law firm, um, you know, you have to deal with different law societies and, and all that sort of thing. So, yeah, I think. Um, you know, the message for everyone is it's actually pretty easy to set up um, a company over there. The other thing worth mentioning is to whether you need to set up a company or not, and I think this is important for people who are listening who, who, are, who are maybe working in regulated industries. You know, for instance, like legal services, you can't um, provide legal services in New Zealand, um, you know, through, through a branch structure. You have to have um, a, you know, a... a ultimately it's a company um, set up over there to do that and so um, you know um, that's that, that's something that needs to be factored in so I guess overall message summing up from you George there is is is, uh, is setting up a company over there is pretty easy and generally if you're planning on you know launching over there it's kind of it's it's a bit of a no-brainer to do that yeah and I think as well with that like typically if you're looking to expand in New Zealand you're wanting to grow and scale quickly and so it kind of gives you that flexibility. So you prove the model in New Zealand with a New Zealand company and you can replicate that across other jurisdictions. Um, equally, if you don't want to pivot away from New Zealand, then you can easily carve that out of your Australian business. So it's just a really um, manoeuvrable structure to use. Sure. And um, just a quick um, note, everyone on the webinar, 
we'll go through a, a few of these points, but then there'll be a lot of uh, time for questions. And so make sure you kind of submit any questions um, through the, 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 the chat and we'll try and get through all of them. We've already actually got some, some questions that, that we'll jump into uh, pretty quickly. All right, so let's move on to intellectual property protection. So this is quite important. It's becoming more important for, for, for I guess, businesses that are operating in that kind of tech space, um, but also businesses that, are, that, are, that, are, that are, you know have a brand that has some value. And ultimately, if, if your business doesn't have a brand that has any value, then, you know, the, there's, there's limited um, industries where you can actually build a, a business that doesn't have a brand and, and that's a successful business. So brand is important for, for most business owners. How do you protect that in New Zealand and how is it different to, to Australia? So really high level comment, really similar protections in terms of ways to protect it in New Zealand. So we do it all through the um, Intellectual Property Office of New Zealand. So ICONS, um, same idea applies. So, you know, if you want to, um, protect your brand logo name, then you look to register a trademark. Um, if you've got a um, particular product or service that's novel, innovative, then that, you know you want to look at registering a patent. Um, I think what you'll find is that if you've gone through that process in Australia, you can use a lot of that content and a lot of those um, that detail to replicate in New Zealand. So you'll find that the icons requirements are pretty similar. The only sort of red flag there I would say is that sometimes it takes up to six months to get those through um, so if you are you know seriously considering a launch into New Zealand then that would probably be one of the first things that I'd be looking to try and do um, in comparison a company can be set up in an hour or two so um, the IP is really critical um, and if you are sort of having those initial conversations in New Zealand with potential you know um, partners or, or suppliers then look before you've gone through that process of registering your, your IP then I'd look to be putting in place non-disclosure agreements or confidentiality agreements just to protect um, your brand while you are having those initial sort of scoping conversations. Sure I mean the NDA kind of question is always an interesting one because you know ultimately no one really ever successfully um, you know, sues on an NDA, but, um, you know, I guess to an extent, NDAs are useful to kind of show that you're kind of serious about about your business, um, more so than necessarily protecting you legally. That's kind of my view anyway. Now, uh, I think another thing worth mentioning, we won't go into too much more detail on, on IP, but what we do see a fair bit is businesses that kind of muddle their way through in Australia and have actually, you know, got, got to a stage where they're, they're, they're having some success and start considering international expansion. Often those businesses haven't actually protected um, their, their trademarks and, 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 and other intellectual property in Australia. So yeah. when you start considering international expansion, say to New Zealand, that can be a trigger for, for kind of going, all right, well, we better sort ourselves out in, in, in Australia as well as kind of, um, you know, New Zealand. So that's something worth, again, um, remembering for everyone that's listening in. So let's, let's then move on to, um, the sort of regulatory and compliance framework in New Zealand. So, of course, you know, anyone running a business in Australia will hopefully be familiar with, you know, the, the regulatory framework that, that, that they're kind of operating in, depending on the business. And we have some, you know, overarching sort of, um, you know, pieces of legislation, which I guess sort of affects most businesses. You know, Australian consumer law is, is, is an important one. You can't really be running a business that deals with any type of consumer if, if you're not, um, ensuring that you're you're complying with Australian consumer law. Are the, are the New Zealand equivalents? How do how do you know what are the big kind of things you need to know about in terms of running your business in, in New Zealand? Yeah, so I think I mean the thing that applies to all businesses will be those consumer protection laws. There's obviously you know depending on what industry you're operating in, you could have other things like your um, food and alcohol licensing and financial service providers and that kind of thing, which are more bespoke to your particular business, but as a general sort of the thing that you need to be focused on are those consumer protection laws. So we've got a, a suite of you know legislation that applies there. Um, same comment as the the trademarking and the IP is that you'll find that they operate in a very similar way to Australia. Uh, there are some nuances. I guess um, one that comes to mind is your privacy officer. So in New Zealand, you are required to have a privacy uh, officer, whereas in Australia, it's sort of recommended best practice. Uh, so it's yeah. little things like that that 
when you're looking at, I guess, your, your business as usual legal documents. So I'm thinking of your uh, terms and conditions, privacy policy, your customer supplier agreements. They're all documents that do need that sort of overlay, that um, compliance review to check that you are compliant with New Zealand law. So unfortunately, you will have to have sort of two sets of documents. Um, but the way that we find it works is generally if in Australia, you've got a really good set of um, robust um, documents that are all fit for purpose that you know work really well with your business, then it's just a matter of, you know, using those as a base um, and just making sure that they have been um, adapted for in, in a New Zealand context. But you will see that they look the same. And then from an operational perspective, obviously, the more that you can align those documents, the more you can align your processes around privacy and the like, you know, it's just easier operating the two businesses going forward. Yeah. You would have found that. Yeah, for easy. sure. I mean, two points on that. One, um, you know, for League of Vision setting up over there, the, the I guess the one thing that's been interesting and, and different has been um, anti-money laundering um, legislation is is more rigorous over over in um, uh, what well, rigorous? I mean, it's um, it's uh, the, the, there's more requirements in terms of you know for a law firm making sure that we've done anti money laundering checks on on more clients. Whereas in Australia, uh, there's not a requirement um, to to do uh, AML checks unless you know you're talking kind of big big amounts of money that are going through a trust account. So you know that's something that's you know like different to Australia. And what we found is the New Zealand market adapts by I guess the service providers that do you know, AML checks, um, you know, obviously for a fee. And so one thing we're, we're thinking about in, in the, whatever industry you're in is, you know, what are the requirements that are different and what's what's going to be the cost to you as a as a, as a business to, to complying with them? Because, you know, th th there are costs. The other thing worth mentioning, and this is, you know, this is one of the reasons we launched in New Zealand is we have so many existing um, Australian clients um, who, you know, who are considering or have launched in New Zealand, operate in New Zealand. And, you know, obviously everyone who's listening in prob probably knows that we operate on, on a membership um, model. Um, LV Connect Pro um, is, is the core uh, product uh, that Legal Vision provides to clients, which is a, um, you know, a, a one, three or five year membership. And that, that, that in, in, in entitles um, clients to, to get basically all their business as usual legal work done um, through that membership. And one of the things we've done is we've added New Zealand law onto that membership offering. So any Australian members um, who, you know, we draft their, 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 their contracts, their legal documents, so on and so forth to work in Australia, we can amend them for New Zealand. You know, a New Zealand team will do that all as part of your membership. So it doesn't actually cost, cost you anything more. And I think that's kind of, you know, for us, um, you know, it, it's working very well um, for, for clients because there are, you know, obviously changes that need to be made to all documents, but ultimately you don't really want to have to go to, you know, frankly, a New Zealand law firm um, and get them to kind of start from scratch, which is what they'll want to do uh, because we operate in both in both countries who are very willing to jump in, make some quick tweaks that work and, 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 and then get moving. So, all right, I think we've had a good chat about the regulatory compliance side of things. Let's go, um, let's go into the practicalities of actually doing business in New Zealand. Um, as opposed to Australia, um, and I can talk a, a bit to this because it's it's been an interesting kind of kind of experience launching over there. But you know, George, do you have some kind of quick things, tips that you think you know are, 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 are different in, in both both jurisdictions in terms of actually doing business? Yeah, I think, um, and I know it's been an experience for us at Legal Vision, and I've always known it's been the case. But um, New Zealand is, uh, you know we operate very similarly to Australia and we, you know, there's no dramatic differences at all, but we are a very loyal um, country. And so I think there is an initial sort of reservation about doing business with Australians or having Australians, having Australians launch in New Zealand. So I think to be able to show that, you know, you are serious about launching in New Zealand, you've got a really local touch, I think is really important. So there's little levers that you can pull really simply to make sure that it is a success in New Zealand. So I'm talking about things like, you know, think about having someone on the ground in New Zealand that can meet people and um, need be, adapt your website and your branding for, the, for a New Zealand context. Um, 
you know, have an 0800 number rather than a 1800 number. It's just really simple things that um, when people first come to you, they sort of think, okay, cool, um, these guys are serious, I'm a New Zealand business, I want to work with the New Zealand business. Um, and the funny thing is, is, you know, there might be that reservation initially, but, you know, you do a good job, you provide a good service, um, you build that trust, and very quickly they won't even notice or won't even care that they're largely working with Australians. So, you know, obviously yeah. not legal considerations at all, but more practical stuff of how you can actually make it launch successfully in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's definitely been our, um, our, our kind of experience. So, so, so we've launched in New Zealand with New Zealand lawyers, but we've, we've, we've maintained our sales team, our marketing team, um, our finance team and so on and so forth in, in Australia to, to basically do a, to launch in a way which was um, enabled us to, 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 to be kind of break even from day one. And certainly um, I think we found from a sales perspective, having frankly people with a New Zealand accent probably um, is helpful in, in, in New Zealand. Um, and, you know, the, yeah, there is certainly a, um, um, I guess in Australia, I don't think people care too much if, yeah, yeah if you if you've got a New Zealand accent or, or any other accent, whereas it feels like New Zealand, it, it, in order to maximise those sales opportunities, it, it's helpful to have uh, people who who are, are local. And that, you know, for any for any anyone launching over there in any type of vertical, um, I think it's something to consider. It's not the only consideration by any means, but it's certainly a, a consideration. And I think um, it's um, it's it's doing yourself a disservice to kind of go uh, that it will be fine. Like it's something that you need to consider. Um, you know, are the are the I guess in terms of um, you know corporate structure and sort of running a business in in New Zealand, is there are there any kind of differences in terms of uh, the roles that people have in businesses over there, or or is it kind of pretty similar to to, to Australia? To be honest, very similar. Um, you know, other than sort of making sure that you're compliant with New Zealand law, the actual way that your business mm. operates will be um, will be pretty largely the same. It's kind of the point that I sort of spoke about, touched on earlier in terms of you know, from an operational perspective, to the extent you can align the way that they operate, then it just makes that launch in New Zealand so much easier. Um, mm. And as you've said, Lachlan, mm. it's, I mean, we've only got the one um, law across the country, um, you don't have to worry about different states and the like. Um, and in saying that, typically, other than AML, uh, which is obviously a headache for us all, but other than AML, mm. I find that the regulatory framework and everything is often um, a little bit um, sort of higher in Australia and so I think you can sort of be relatively comfortable obviously you do want you know sign off on it but I think you can be relatively mm -hmm. comfortable that if you've got the right systems and processes in place and you're compliant with Australian law you're probably going to be largely fine in New Zealand um, yeah. there's obviously yeah. exceptions to that but there's a real comfort in that being like they operate pretty similarly and actually it's probably yeah more requirements in Australia, so provided I'm doing it okay there, then I can I can replicate that here without too much too much trouble. And I think, you know, in terms of obviously every business is different, but in terms of a New Zealand launch, mm -hmm. um, the benefits of New Zealand are obviously it's close, the regulatory framework's similar, um, the mindset is similar. So if you're selling your product in Australia, you should be able or product or service in Australia, you should be able to sell it in New Zealand. Um, Nevertheless, it, th there is a cost to launching in any other jurisdiction. Um, and the downside of New Zealand is that it is small. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're considering um, different countries where you could launch and you kind of do your kind of, you know, analysis of various options, um, the, the the biggest downside of New Zealand is is the size of the jurisdiction, the size of the size of the kind of the cut size of the customer market. So I think what we do see with a lot of our clients is um, you know they sort of launch in New Zealand as a a testing ground for a first launch, and you can, you know first overseas launch you can you can do it relatively cost effectively, so on and so forth. But you've got to assume that you know top line revenue, um, EBIT, everything is only ever going to be you know at best a fifth of the size of what you're doing in Australia. Um, and, and that, you know, the amount that you, you're going to invest in, in, in New Zealand from a, from a, you know, from a 
capital perspective, it's important to, to take that into consideration. The market is just smaller. There are less people searching online for, for anything. Um, and so, you know, your, your investment, the amount you invest needs to kind of take that into account. I think that's, that, that's sort of important. And what we do see is, is, you know, a good number of clients will, will frankly go, well, you know, we'll ignore New Zealand and go, okay, we're going to do the US, we're going to do the UK, we're going to go um, Asia um, for that reason. Um, and so it really depends on the type of business you're running um, in terms of whether it's 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 a sensible um, uh, sensible decision. Um, let's jump into questions. So um, if, if you can start sending through um, you know questions, um, we've we've already got a few that have been sent through. So we'll start with those. But you know, in the meantime, if you've got um, questions you want answered, um, you know, start sending them through. So this is a good one, I think. Um, what grants are available for Australian businesses to expand into New Zealand? Do you have any kind of insight into that, um, George? Uh, I can't say I'm overly familiar with the grants that are available, but I yeah. do know there's an um, export market development grant, um, and that helps yeah. you expand into overseas markets. Um, other than that, I just know there's good grant finding tools on, on the Australian government website yeah, yeah, sure. that you can use. Um, yeah. yeah. Actually, just to, just on that, you know, just remembering that that the, the Australian Export um, uh, Credit Development Grant is unfortunately New Zealand is the only country in the world oh, that, <laughs> that that yeah that you you, you can't get it for. Um, so I remember looking into that when when we launched in, in New Zealand. So um, yeah, so yeah, um, that's 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 worth remembering. Um, this is a good one. Um, when incorporating a company in New Zealand, can the company officials be Australian residents or does the company need to hire an, a New Zealand director? Yes, a good question. Um, basically, there is a New Zealand resident director requirement, but that can be satisfied by an Australian resident director, provided they're also a director of the Australian company. Um, so, you know, if you've got an Australian company already set up, then you just put that director into your New Zealand company and you, you've satisfied that requirement. So pretty straightforward. Yeah. That's actually what we did with um, with Lego Vision. So um, yeah, um, again, um, so related question is: Do New Zealand companies need New Zealand New Zealanders as directors? So we've answered that. Um, can an Australian company own one hundred percent of a New Zealand company? Um, that's that's a good question. Yeah. So no issues with that. Um, and often people will do. So when we're talking about, you know, requirements of overseas ownership and stuff, you're looking at things over 20%. So if you're 100% owned by Australian subsidiary, there's, there's no, sorry, Australian company, there's no problems with that. You know, we obviously have similar foreign investment rules in New Zealand as you do in Australia, but there's, um, and they actually were highly sort of increase during COVID, but they've gone back to the normal um, thresholds now. But it's worth noting that Australia has got significantly higher thresholds. So you're only getting, needing to get approval if you're talking about, you know, things over value of 500 million. So having a, um, setting up a new company with a sole uh, Australian company as your, your shareholder is, is no problem at all. Look, if anyone on this call is looking to buy a company uh, that's worth over half a billion, New Zealand dollars. Yes, um, we would be happy to assist. So get in touch. Uh, okay. Um, uh, yeah, this is this is a very good question. So, um, with regards to the separate company in New Zealand setup, can you elaborate on the pros and cons of an Australian shareholder-owned company versus a subsidiary company structure? So, I think what they're talking about is getting your Australian shareholders to own the New Zealand company versus having your Australian company own the New Zealand company. Yes, and Lachlan, you might want to expand on this as well, but the the key sort of consideration there that you're looking at with the differences between the two are your tax implications. Um, and so when I talk about flexibility of setting up your New Zealand company, that gives you flexibility to try and avoid these double taxing arrangements and the like. What we're doing there is we're sitting down with the client saying, look, what's your what's your structure in Australia? How do you want to do it in New Zealand? Are your shareholders companies or they a trust? Um, how can we make it work for you so that you're not subject to those double taxing arrangements? And so sometimes the result of those conversations is that, well, look, actually, it should be a separate company um, directly owned by your Australian shareholders, essentially. Um, and what we do is obviously we're not tax and accounting specialists, so so we would work with your 
um, the tax advisor on that as well. Um, the one caution I say is that, you know, obviously the tax considerations are really critical and you want to be ensure compliance, um, but they shouldn't be your sole driving factor in terms of deciding your structure. Um, you know, obviously, you know, the IRD are there to, you know, regulate against fraud and avoidance, and they're not actually concerned about legitimate business models. So make sure that it works for you first, um, and then figure out your tax implications and whether it works for you or not. Um, I think that's right. Look, the, it, 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 obviously, every company is different, right? So if if you're, you know, you, you're a, you're a company that's only two shareholders, and you're only ever going to have two shareholders, um, that's you know, it's easy to manage. So you need to change things, you can get signatures, so on and so forth, that's it, that's easy enough. If you're more of a kind of tech startup or fast growth business that has raised external capital, uh, potentially raised um, external capital from, from a bunch of angel investors and a couple of VCs, you could have a, you know, you could have 30 investors um, in, in your Australian holding company. It would be frankly impossible, um, ridiculous and a waste of time to, ask all of those people to become shareholders in your New Zealand entity, because it would be complicated, annoying, um, you know, just a pain to manage. So what you really want is to have one holding company, um, whether that's, you know, obviously if you started in Australia, it'd probably be in Australia. For some Australian startups, that might be actually a, a Delaware incorporated uh, US um, uh, entity. But regardless, you have one holding company that that, that all of the, um, shareholders um, own shares in, and that holding company owns 100% of all the subsidiaries in different countries. Um, you know that that's that's kind of the way things things are generally done. But again, you know every business is different, um, and so that's a, that's a general rule. But you know obviously we would talk to you and, and get an understanding of what you're trying to achieve and and, and take it from there. Um, Question on trademarks. I already have a trademark registered in Australia. Is it worthwhile to get that trademark in New Zealand? Yeah, so the idea is that you protect it in your local jurisdiction. So if you are operating in New Zealand, make sure that you do the same in New Zealand and get it protected here. Um, you just don't want to build up your brand and reputation in Australia, have it protected in Australia, then launch in New Zealand and, and don't have similar protections. Um, and as I said before, it's one of those things that, you know, all the work that you've done to get it registered in Australia, you'll be able to replicate that here. Um, so it's, that's certainly what we'd recommend. It's usually your key business asset. Um, and so yeah. it's just not worth the risk of, of yeah. not doing it. And, and indeed, um, you know, trademark registration is something you should be, in my view at least, planning quite a bit in advance. So if you're thinking, uh, you know, in three years time, we might want to expand to the UK, in two years time to the US, you know, my view is you should be registering those trademarks um, in those jurisdictions now, because what you the, the thing you don't want is to get to the stage where your business is going really well, you're about to expand there, and then someone's, you know, registered a trademark, maybe, um, you know, to try and do you over, and then you have to get into a sort of legal stoush over, you know, who are, you know, can you get it back from that individual and so on and so forth. So, you know, planning trademark registration well in advance and, and, and you know, investing in, in, in getting that done, I think is very important. Um, again, with, with our um, LV Connect Pro subscription product, we can do that for you, um, you know, all, all included in, in, in that fee. So I think that's, that's something worth considering. Um, this is a good question on employment law. Is there something similar to fair work that we must comply with in, in New Zealand from, a, from an HR perspective, uh, I guess from, from an employment law perspective? That is a good question. Um, I'm not an employment lawyer and I don't know the answer to that. Okay. No, not, uh -huh. not from my knowledge, but I think um, I think I have, I think there might be something in the in the play to, to implement something similar, but I'm not sure. Lachlan, do you know? Okay. No, what, what we'll do on that is, um, whoever asked that question is a good question. Um, yeah. answer it right now. So what we'll do is we'll, um, in, in the follow-up, there'll be an email sent around with a follow-up and we'll put a bit of information in there about um, employment law in New Zealand. My understanding from talking to business owners in New Zealand, people who run reasonable sized businesses in New Zealand, is that it's kind of a, a bit more difficult to manage um, employees in New Zealand than in Australia, which I, I know it's quite difficult in Australia. So that's, that's the sort of generic feedback that, that I can give. Uh, but we'll, we'll put some more information um, as to specifically what you need to comply with from an employment law perspective. Um, 
Look, there's a couple of franchising questions here. How familiar are you with sort of franchising um, in, in New Zealand? Um, well, I saw, um, I saw there's sort of quite a lot of interest around whether, you, you know, that's an option in terms of expanding into mm. New Zealand. And um, look, mm. I think it's, it is a really popular option if you've yeah. already got a franchise set up in Australia. It's kind of the same principles apply in terms of, you know, you'll need to adapt your franchise agreement and your ops menu and all that kind of stuff for it um, yeah. in New Zealand context and comply with New Zealand law. Um, we're yeah. actually got a slightly um, easier, I guess, regulatory framework in New Zealand for franchising. So yeah. um, if you can do that, yeah. um, then that's a great option. If you don't have... That's, it, uh, that's definitely the, the, the key message, I think, on franchising with, with New Zealand. So um, in Australia, um, you know, anyone who's in franchising will, will know that um that the, there have been recent changes again to the legislation to make franchising even more onerous on the franchisor uh, new zealand has a much much laxer um more relaxed kind of franchising um sort of um framework so if you're if you can run a franchise in, in australia you can definitely run one in new zealand <laughs> um and so that's you know Look, we see a lot of, of clients who, who decide to kind of franchise in New Zealand. It's, it's you know, it's actually a great model. I think um, if you've got a franchise network to consider New Zealand as, you know, not the be all and end all, but certainly as just another state. You know, you think of it as another state, it, it's a way of getting another, another you know, 20% uh, top line revenue potentially, you know, with a similar kind of, um, you know, uh, sort of way of doing business over there. Um, and, you know, ultimately with a franchise structure, you potentially don't even need to set up a New Zealand company. You can just have a, you know, a master franchise for New Zealand, which you do from Australia. So, yeah, I'd say for anyone in the franchising space, the equation around cost to set up over there, difficulty of running things over there versus the size of the, the, the economy, um, you're much more on the side of it makes sense to do it. Um, you know, if you're, you know, if you're selling something that New Zealanders are going to want. Um, all right, let's let's keep let's keep moving. Um, some of these questions are, are sort of um, uh, are more kind of running a business style. So so we'll see if we can we can go through them. Superannuation. Uh, what's the uh, the New Zealand equivalent of superannuation? Um, if we don't register a company over there, do we still need to pay uh, New Zealand super? Yes, yeah, so the equivalent is KiwiSaver, yeah, um, and if you don't have it, well, it depends on obviously where your employees are, but as soon as, I mean, the bigger question is as soon as you've got employees in New Zealand and having to register for tax, um, it tends to, or for at least six months, um, and so it tends to make sense that you do actually have a New Zealand business here because you're having to comply with those KiwiSaver obligations anyway in regards to those employees, so um, mm -hmm. Again, that's something that's a bigger question of how you want to structure it. But to the extent you've got New Zealand employees, then you have to comply with those KiwiSaver obligations. Um, operates yep. in a similar way to Australia, um, but yeah, slightly different regime. And what uh, what's what percent are you are you paying in 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 terms of super? So you, super? So you kind of you are left as an employee between I think at the moment it's between three and nine percent, um, and yep. compulsory contributions by the employer at three percent okay um billing and payments what do we need to do as an australian business to bill and take payment from our new zealand clients so that's not really a legal question i'd say i mean look the the, the reality is you can run a business from australia um, and take payment from clients all over the world um that you you don't need to set up in those jurisdictions so obviously it depends on what you know, payment kind of structure you're doing. But frankly, you can just send an, an invoice with your bank details and get your clients to transfer the money into, you know, your Australian bank account. Um, if you're selling to an overseas, um, you know, entity or whatever, you don't need to charge GST. Um, so there is that. But again, your accountant should be explaining this to you and, and helping you set it up. If you're selling at volume, um, you know, obviously, generally makes sense to use um, a, a product like Stripe, which will enable you to um, more easily, um, you know, send you know, payment requests, get paid, 
um, in multiple uh, currencies and so on and so forth. Uh, but yeah, to be super clear, if you're just sell, if you're an Australian business that has international customers, you don't need to set up um, o o over there. The reason to set up somewhere like New Zealand is if you you want to a you have to like say you're a law firm and you want to provide New Zealand legal services, you have to have a New Zealand um, entity. But it's also if you know if you're selling a, a product that requires you to kind of get out there, meet clients, um, you know maybe have um, you know, inventory or whatever in in country and and all that sort of thing. That that's when you start need to start thinking about um, having a um, and obviously employing people. That's that's that's, that's the other thing. Um, app development with an app um, um, in the app store. Are you already essentially launched in multiple markets, or do you need to do something specific? Yes, you're already launched in in multiple markets. Um, you know, with with, with an app, you're, you're selling internationally from day one or maybe not in you know china or wherever but you know wherever that the app store is 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 available you're selling so there's nothing you need to do there. um i guess this is a good question though in terms of ios android apps there are any specific differences in laws or compliance when launching in australia versus new zealand and would the revenue from the app be subject to both australia and new zealand tax um okay so one thing I think worth mentioning in terms of your uh, an app. Uh, look, the terms, conditions, and whatever are, are important, but the privacy side of things, I think, is is what you need to be thinking about. Um, so, if you've got an app, you launch uh, and and you, you, it's available in New Zealand, so on and so forth. You, you will need to be and will need to comply with whatever New Zealand privacy laws are. Uh, same with the EU, um, and same with the US. So I think what most people do, and again, this is very generic, is is go. I'm going to comply with GDPR, which are which is the kind of EU um, privacy laws. And if you're complying with those, you can be pretty sure. And correct me if I'm wrong, um, Georgina, um, that you you're kind of okay in New Zealand or Australia or whatever else. Yeah. Um, Hiring question, do we need um, to be incorporated in New Zealand to hire um, a New Zealand based um, employee? We have a couple of large New Zealand clients and presently have a contractor assisting us. It kind of goes to what you touched on before Lachlan in terms of um, what's your actual presence in New Zealand. So as soon as you've got someone that's there employed for over six months, um, then that's when you need to be looking at either registering as a overseas company in New Zealand or actually incorporating a new company. So, you know, you can do it for only so long, but as soon as you've got that employee there that relatively permanently, then that's when, yeah, you do need to register as a business here, um, apply for your AID number, um, and yeah, you're basically operating in New Zealand from that point. And important to note that an employee is obviously different to a contractor. Um, and so a contractor, that's okay. Um, but then, of course, you, you need to start considering, although I'm saying this person's a contractor, are they actually a contractor or are they an employee? Now, look, let's be honest. You've got one, you know, chap over there. I really highly doubt the New Zealand, you know, tax authority is going to kind of, you know, come down too, too hard on that. It's more when you start building up a bit of sort of momentum that's when you need to start thinking, okay, well, um, and the other thing of course is at a certain size, it, it actually becomes more cost effective to, um, to run things out of New Zealand. Because another benefit of New Zealand that we didn't really mention is that it is a, overall, it's a cheaper place um, to kind of, things are a bit cheaper. Um, uh, and so there is a, a, cost, a cost benefit there. Think about, you know, a bunch of the big banks, for instance, will, you know, have um, have big teams over in New Zealand who are who are, who are servicing Australian um, Australian work, and it's because there's a kind of you know there's a, there's a cost saving there. Um, but obviously, um, you know, it's a matter of kind of you know working out all right. Well, you know, where's the line? And that, for each business, that line is different. Um, we don't have very long now, so I'm going to quickly um, you know we're, we're worth mentioning. So, as I said at the beginning of the the, the call. What we're offering to everyone attending um, the, the the call is a is a free strategy session to discuss your business structure and expansion plans. So you know what what that basically entails is look you're thinking about um, 
launching over in New Zealand or you're over there and you're thinking, okay, how do we get the structure right? We've got a, a, a session where uh, Georgina or one of our other team members will, 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 will sit down with you uh, probably on uh, on Zoom if the lockdowns kind of uh, continues on as, as, uh, as it's going and and talk and sort of run you through, okay, what are the different options for you, so on and so forth. All free. Um, we'll, we'll also, we're also offering um, a free month of access to our LB Connect Pro membership. So LB Connect Pro is our core product. Um, you know, the, we've got hundreds and thousands of clients um, that, that, that are members of LB Connect Pro. Um, and um, we're offering, if you sign up for a one, three or five year contract, we're offering a month um, free um, for anyone who's um, attended this. So jump on a strategy call. All you've got to do is click yes to the pop-up um, that you'll see um, after the webinar leave your contact information and then we'll get in touch. Um, or you can, we'll send an email around afterwards, um, yeah, particularly in relation to that employment law question. And um, and you can reply to that if you, if you wanna book in for a strategy call as well. Um, so look, um, conscious of time, thank you very much all for attending. We're trying to do a couple of webinars um, a week. The topics are chosen because this is what members in particular, but also you know, um, you know people who aren't, aren't Legal Vision members, are wanting us to talk about. So um, we'll be doing a lot more of them. Make sure you sign up if it's a topic that interests you. Um, and thank you very much, um, Georgina, for, for, for jumping on this with us. And um, uh, yeah, if anyone's got any questions specific to New Zealand, George will be delighted to um, you know, uh, answer them, send any emails through, jump on a call. So thanks yeah, again absolutely. and uh, good luck to everyone in Sydney. Hopefully we get out of this um, current situation uh, relatively quickly. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone.